much. Cheers for joining us, mate. Ollie, yeah, thank, thank you. you. So first question we always ask, what's the most important lesson you've ever learned? Yeah, there's a couple couple good ones I've um, learned. But probably it's a bit of a cliche to say this one, but um, that hard work will always beat talent. Like Talent gets you so far. Talent can get you s- scouted. It can get you eyes on you that you need, the eyes on you that you need and stuff like that. But it'll only get you that far. Yeah. It'll only get the uh, initial recognition. It'll only get you to a certain level before you're going to have to start putting some graft in to sort of kick on from there. So that's probably probably the most important one I've ever ever learnt, really. Yeah, definitely. Very relevant to sport as well. Yeah. So we normally ask guests to just describe themselves and sort of give a little bit of intro about themselves, but um, reading your story, I thought I'd do it myself. So 17th of November 2018 versus Wasps at Franklin's Gardens. You scored on your debut with 14 seconds of coming on the pitch. Yeah. So Northampton lad yourself. Yeah. Played rugby all your life in Northampton. I take it Northampton fan yeah, yeah. since you were a kid. A kid, yeah. What just describe the emotions that must have been going through after scoring on your debut at your home team's ground? Yeah, it was it was pretty nuts. Um, I can't really remember it, so I have no real recollection of actually scoring or anything like that. Um, I remember before it coming onto the pitch and shaking and being really nervous and feeling like I I don't know how I'm going to do anything on this pitch. I'm, I, all <laughs> I can do is stand here at the moment. And I remember after it, the last thing I remember is literally turning around and Luther was stood there, literally grabbed hold of me and then it was sort of that's when my sort of memory came back. But the moment of catching the ball to get into the line, I have no recollection of whatsoever. <laughs> I remember watching it. It was crazy. Yeah. It was crazy. Uh, how old were you when that when you scored that? I'd have been 18. Wow. I think. Wow. Um, so take us back. Where did When did you start playing rugby? Um, what club? How old were you? So I didn't start till what would a normal like most people would see is quite late. I, I say quite late. I was sort of eight years old. A lot of people start now. You're looking at four four year old kids starting. Yeah. I, I was eight, um, and obviously, so my dad played before me at Northampton, and he never really pushed me into doing any of it or took me down to a rugby club. He just let me get on with it, and it was a, one of my mates that played that said, "Oh, do you want to come down?" Which was what sort of triggered me going down from there. Cool. So did you um, from eight years old? Did you always think? I want to do this for a career or when did when did that sort of become a reality for you? Um, I think every kid that, that plays sport wants to do it. Yeah. It's wants to do it for a living if they can. It's just, it's more the moment that it switches in your head where you realise it could be sort of a possibility to do that and yeah. it could be something you could do. And I think I wasn't, I didn't really believe any of it until I actually got my contract at 18. Wow. I, I had no idea. Well, I got dropped at sort of 14, 15, 15, 16, and then slowly came back into it, sort of 17, then got a contract, 18. But yeah, I did, really didn't believe any of it until sort of 18. So what's Sorry, go on, mate. Sorry. I think that there's been a lot of stories like similar to yours where there's been, I know there was one with Declan Rice, I think it was, where it was kind of um and an hour and they actually got dropped. He got dropped from what he was doing. Um, do you think that was kind of like a bounce back thing or does that make you want to work harder or was it kind of like... You had a bit of time where you were thinking, maybe this isn't for me. Uh, yeah, I think it made me work a lot harder. Sort of coming back to that that question at the start of what was my most important lesson I've learned and how the hard work. And there, there was kids that probably were more talented than me. But that sort of push that they gave me from from dropping me sort of forced me into working hard and forced me to make different decisions. It's quite cutthroat, isn't it, as well? I guess like any pro sport, but I know like from my experience playing rugby, never got anywhere sort of like massive, but got in like a couple of the sort of like rep teams, like, you know, like early Saints stuff and East Mids and stuff. And I know from the group of like 50, 60 lads, there's like two that are pro now. Yeah. I think Dingwall was probably the only one that was my age group that plays for Saints at the minute. So Yeah. I yeah, think it's, it's very, very cutthroat. Like you yeah. say, like from... So my age group now, there's two of us left. There was five that initially got contracted. Now there's only two. Um, and yeah, when you look back to when you were 14 and there's four squads of 50, 60 lads, you're yeah. looking at 200 players that come down to five. Yeah. And then that five then gets taken down to two after three or four years. Yeah, It's quite a, quite a sort of, when you look at it like that, it's quite a scary concept, is, I guess. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Did you think about that when you were younger? Like, did you sort of look up and think, like, you know, the years above me, there's been so many of them and 
there's only a real small percentage that push on? Uh, I think you always know it and you're always told it going through the sort of the academy and the age group stuff. I think it's just a case of knowing that that's what's going to happen and knowing what you can do to put yourself in the best position to be one of those that does go forward and does kick on. I think that that all comes down to sort of the mindset you have and also whether you really want to do it. Yeah. A lot of people, some people like the idea but don't like all the stuff that comes with it. Yeah, that's true. So you like the idea of being a professional rugby player or a football player or whatever it is but don't want to do the stuff people don't see. Yeah. And don't want to don't want to do that sort of side of it. I think that's a quite a big thing with sports get into like a such a high level a lot of people think that especially the people that are like very casual about sports they kind of think that oh it's plain sailing if you're good you're good if you're bad you're bad they don't really understand you know like the extra how much effort you actually have to put in how much training that goes into it how much you have to dedicate your life to it i think that's quite a big thing that a lot of people don't really definitely into consideration yeah definitely so tell us a little bit about your dad because obviously i know from from like being a rugby fan for a long time but your dad's like quite big for Northampton fans and like older generation Northampton fans. Your dad's quite a big sort of name, isn't he? Well, yeah, I don't know about big, but we'll, <laughs> we'll go with it. Um, yeah, he is, so he was in the he was at Saints. Uh, so initially he was at Bath, played at Bath for a few years, moved to Saints. Uh, in in between there, played sort of twelve caps for England in between that time. Um, but when he moved to Saints, Let's brush over that twelve caps yeah. for England. <laughs> um, when he came to Saints, it was he was here from I can't remember uh, late nineteen nineties to sort of two thousand and three. Yeah. So he was in in the squad that won the Heineken Cup. Right. Or what I can't remember was it still called the Heineken Cup back then? I can't yeah. remember the European Cup. Um, and yeah, he didn't play the final. We played the semi and got injured in the semi or something like that. But yeah, so he the that squad is also probably Northampton one of Northampton's yeah. along with uh, the Premiership win is probably Northampton's top accolade that they look yeah, at definitely. and yeah to have him be involved in that makes me quite proud and yeah. makes me want to sort of try and replicate some of the stuff he did definitely did you feel any any sort of was there any pressure or expectation not from your dad but like when you came into the squad um and got your pro contract was it like mentioned about your dad or uh not really because there's so there were so many at the, the well there still is and there was there was more at the time when I came in. You were looking at so you had a couple that had just left. So Howard Patman, yeah, um, Harry Malander was still there. Obviously, Grace is still there. Toops was with me. A few other lads that all all have dads that played for the club and or dads that played professional rugby. Yeah. So it's sort of like I think in any sort of sport, um, mate, whether it's genetically or what it is, you're always going to get sons of. Or sons of sons and stuff like that because you look at any sport they've, they've all got them football's got it rugby's got it cricket's got it you it's just it must be a genetic thing yeah. but um so it's sort of seen as the norm i guess it's, it's a normal thing to see yeah. it's not really mentioned within the squad mm-hmm. or within anything like that the only other mentions you the mentions you will get are from people that aren't fans as such that are detached yeah, yeah. from what actually going on if that makes sense yeah. and well you do get some like you know, speak to grace more about it as well if you ever speak to him uh, some sort of throwaway comments that you do get from people but you've just got to you know you're always going to get them yeah have you ever had any shit about it not about not really stuff. you just you sort of brush it off you know yeah. they're just they don't really know what they're talking about they're just saying it to try and get a yeah, try yeah. and get reaction out of you so there's no point in yeah have you had any negative sort of comments in general like from coming up at a very young age at 18 and like sort of bursting onto the scene in like rugby terms, have you have you had much negativity that you've had to deal with? Well, there's, there's always negativity and if you, <laughs> anyone can go on the uh, the Instagram and Facebook posts after a loss and look, yeah. at, the, look at the comments on there, but um, I try and avoid it. Yeah, I don't go on there. Yeah. There's no point. Like, it's like if you were in a, let's say you worked at, as a banker, and some guy that has nothing, no idea about how to be a banker mm. tells you you're rubbish at being a banker. Yeah. You're going to be like, mate, you don't know what you're going on about. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. But the only thing is with ours, it's public. Yeah. So everyone's seeing it. I suppose that's the only difference really that 
the sort of public aspect of it. But yeah, it's you've just got to sort of brush it off. They they're just they're just saying it because they're angry that their team have lost and they're passionate. At the end of the day, they're passionate fans, and yeah. you can't get too bogged down by it and stressed out about it because win next week and there will be yeah they'll be singing your praises yeah, the yeah exactly it's, it's difficult yeah. for like young players in in every sport now because like you you want to sort of build like a personal brand don't you on on your social medias and stuff and there's like certain benefits to having big followings and getting you know sort of like promotional deals and stuff but then i guess social media is where all the negativity comes from isn't it you don't really get people coming up to your face and saying that you played shit they'll go online and do it yeah no exactly that's that's it you can have these accounts that I've got some random picture. You don't know who they yeah. are, what they're doing, but they'll 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 say stuff on online that they would never dream of saying in person, and it's sort of like a shield, I guess, for them. And but yeah, you just got to look at it how it is, and it's just yeah, ig- sort of ignore it, I guess. Yeah, I know. I know a lot of other lads, not even at Saints, at other clubs and stuff like that, do or have not dealt with it in the best way before, and not dealt with it as well. And I think speak to any of the people that have had that sort of experience and they'll tell you now that it's yeah. you just got to brush it off and ignore it it's yeah. Yeah. it must be quite a culture shock coming from you know you, you, you feel like you're doing the best thing and you're, you're trying your hardest and then you've got these what trolls now on in yeah. on the internet is every single area of life there will always be someone that's ready to chop your head off if you do something wrong and then the next week they sing your face it's like going yeah. back to they see you in person, they'll be like, oh, you're right, I'll take yeah. a picture and all this shit. And then you go online and they've got a troll account and they're mm-hmm. saying every bad thing under the sun. It's just yeah, it's yeah. just how it, yeah. especially now with how big social media is yeah. and how much it's publicised, because obviously before there wasn't really a platform for these people to do it. So I think that definitely plays a massive part in, mm. in, in sport, especially for younger lads. It definitely does, yeah. So before we, uh, our podcast sort of centred around students and student listeners, so um, we want to move on to sort of like how education's played a part. Before we do, there's like another sort of side to your career with with England and with sort of rep rugby. So um, I know you played sort of age group for England, didn't you? And then um, did you get called into the like training camp for the senior squad as well? So what's what's the difference between like playing club rugby in your hometown with all your mates to going off to these sort of camps with England? Um... I guess initially it's that the aspect of I don't know anyone and that yeah. not fear but sort of the unknown of oh I don't know anyone all that sort of thing so am I gonna is am I gonna fit in especially when going into so for example my first year of twenties um, there was a group obviously that had played the previous year because obviously you get two years at twenties. So it's got 18 to 20, so when you, you play for two years, if you're born, I can't remember what the, the months are, but if you're born a certain time, you can play for two years. So there was a big group that had played together already for a year. Um, obviously, good mates. And then you're going into that environment, not knowing anyone or knowing a few people and trying to fit in. So it's a little bit of a weird one. Yeah. And you get the same, obviously, going into the senior stuff. Yeah. That must have been a proper shock because I guess like age group stuff, everyone's your age and they're all you're all like sort of like up and coming talent at your clubs a couple of people are sort of starting to get like starts in the prem and stuff but what was it like going into that senior camp with like your own farrells and like marrows like your real sort of world-class talents what was that like for the first time yeah like i said it's, it's almost like almost a bit scary like you you don't know how to what to do, what to say, sort of thing. But w- once you've been there for even a couple of hours, you sort of you start to lo- ease up a bit and just relax a bit into it, and then it becomes a, mo- a lot more enjoyable environment. Yeah, I bet. So, um, lastly, on on sort of rugby stuff. Um, obviously, like coming up at a, at a young age at eighteen, and is that when you signed your pro contract at eighteen? Yeah, yeah. So, what sort of um, stuff that like the clubs have in place for? these young lads because uh, obviously we can only imagine but yeah, you're going to be earning a bit more money than a 19 year old like working down Tesco's so what do what do like pro clubs have in place to like help you with that sort of like different life that you live into a lot of people your age uh yeah that it's more so I'd say the people around you like your your 
the other people in the same position as you that help and you can talk with each other about and they become the people you spend most of your time with, I guess. Um, so you obviously see your mates and stuff and they're all, they're never all like weird about it or anything like that because yeah. they're your mates that are happy for you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the clubs do have sort of, sort of what you, we call, we call like our HR directors that will help you with stuff like that and yeah. talk you through best ways to do things and how not to do things sort of thing. Yeah. Did you have to have any sort of like personal words with yourself when you sort of started like, you know, getting these like pro contracts and like all your sort of like appearance fees and all that sort of stuff? Did you have to like sort of like speak to yourself internally and say like, I need to stay switched on here, like focus on the rugby, not focus on, on the other the other stuff that can come with like sort of getting that level of fame at a young age? Yeah, definitely. I think, I think, you always do, and I never let myself get to a point where I had to have those words because I knew, obviously, Dad was a big uh, role in that and speaking to me, and yeah, I never really got to a stage where I had to, but that was the main thing that was focused on rugby and everything else will sort itself out. Yeah, because I guess in in every sport, there's like you hear it all the time, don't you? Of people sort of going, like you know, bursting onto the scene at like eighteen, and then by twenty, it's sort of gone to their head and. You know, yeah, like it, you know, you can only like be told you're great so many times until you like start believing it yourself, can't you? So, yeah, I think yeah, like you say, it's a case of like my my motto was keep my head down, play rugby, and let rugby talk for everything else. Mm -hmm. Everything else will sort itself out. Don't need to worry about contracts, anything like that. If you're playing well, that stuff will sort itself out. Yeah, yeah. So going on to to sort of like the um, the education side, which is like a big focus of our podcast um it's obviously very different for like sportsmen at a young age because obviously like we all at 18 we left sixth form and went off to uni but yeah. you guys have just signed like professional contracts yeah. what's the um what's the sort of process of education does it just stop at 18 once you sign these pro contracts or it doesn't have to a lot of lads do do sort of open unis or part-time uni courses or so i personally don't do uni i do so i'm doing a strength and conditioning Okay. Sort of diploma sort of thing that's I'm I'm sort of halfway through. And the, yeah, there's loads we have a large sort of group slash people to help us navigate our way through different education ideas. So right. the HR people do that really well. The RPA, so our, our union yeah. do a load of work with it and loads of uh, workshops and um days where you can go and look and speak to businesses about doing different types of education with them and stuff like that so it's very it's i'd say it's more encouraged than it is discouraged right okay what what does uni look like for lads at, from like the, your experience for your teammates what does uni look like for pro players yes yeah, so they're either doing open uni so they'll do a couple of hours in the evening yeah most of them will do seven eight hours on a day off stuff like that or there's a couple of lads that do do part-time and will travel to the uni a couple yeah. of nights a week or something like that and it will normally be a Tuesday before our day off and they'll then stay over at the uni or stay at someone they know's house in yeah. in London or Nottingham wherever they are and yeah do that do okay. those two days I can imagine that the uni lifestyle that we've experienced is yeah, a, bit a bit hell of a lot different yeah. to yeah. what it would be I think, I think the, case, like the difference is with the lads that do do it is they are there solely for the degree yeah yeah and there there's no uni sort of social aspects oh, or yeah, like yeah. none of that it's literally they're there well, you get that with rugby anyway so we've got the sort of so they're just there to get the degree done yeah and that's it and they get they obviously can't go and get on the smash every night yeah. <laughs> and then turn up to train and the next day hungover but yeah yeah off topic but i want to know for myself what's it like when you're 18 and you go into these like infamous rugby socials at these pro clubs I think pro clubs get a not a bad rap, mm. but it's a lot less than I thought it was going to be. Right, a lot a lot nicer and a lot better than I thought it was going to be compared to what I've heard from friends that've been at uni. Yeah, doing yeah, uni. Some of these uni, uni ones. Uh, I think they can get away with it a bit more. Yeah, yeah because <laughs> if if we did some of the what the stories I've heard from the unis would. Mm. And that got out in the papers yeah, or anything no, like that, you'd be absolutely yeah. slaughtered. Like, um, but some of the stuff I've heard, mates, uh, yeah, it, yeah, it's nothing like that in 
in the pro environment. Do you have to be careful in general? Because I've seen, like, I, I don't know if you have, but I've seen like Saints lads around MBs and stuff. But yeah. <laughs> I've never ever, you never see like a Saints player absolutely smashed. Oh yeah, no. No, yeah, I think so. The thing is, nowadays, everyone's got a phone. Yeah. And you just pull it out and record something. Um, speaking to someone like the, like Dad and a few of his old boy mates, it was like when they played, no one had yeah. camera yeah, phones. You, just do, you do what you want. <laughs> and if someone went, oh, he's done this, they'd be like, well, yeah. you've got no proof, so it yeah. doesn't really matter. Yeah. Like, it's probably not a great way to live your life, but <laughs> yeah. so, like, when you could you, do a lot more. So when you go out, yeah. Night out, are you do you kind of have this in the back of your mind like yeah I'm someone right could out. be videoing me yeah 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 kind of someone could be videoing me yeah so that sort of don't get too drunk because if you do something stupid someone will video it yeah, yeah. I think that's quite hard for quite, like young lads that yeah. especially just heading eighteen and they want to yeah. go out and experience what it's like to you know go out and get smashed with your mates and so I think surely is there a time that you think like oh the, fuck this like I just want to go and do whatever, or is so it kind of yeah, that we, discipline to the point where you're like, I don't need to? Yeah, I suppose you do get, the, like any, like anyone with the temptations, but like, we, you always get the opportunity to do it behind closed doors or in your yeah, own house yeah. or something like that if you want to, like, yeah. we'll have socials where we don't go out and stuff like that, so there, and also socials that we're in, a, quite often if it's our socials that are in a bigger group mm. are normally a lot well, you you feel a lot safer in that aspect because you've got so many eyes about. Yeah. No one's going to pull out a phone and start recording. Yeah, you're all in the same. Yeah. yeah. Have you had to, I guess, like, um, you said earlier about, like, keeping good mates around you yep. in terms of, like, like coming up at 18 and stuff like that. I imagine it's the same with the social aspect of, of like, being a young lad as well because I would imagine that you've had to sort of, like, make sure that the people that you have around you outside of rugby are also, like, respect what you do and respect, like, sort of privacy of it as well. Yeah, exactly. Like, I've got a very, I'd, what I'd call a small group of friends. Um, I'd probably count them on a hand, like, the people that I'd, I'd class as my, tr- like, best mates. Um, and, yeah, they all they all know know what the crack is. They know yeah. They know what I've got to do, when I've got to do things, and what I can't do. And if I say, lad, sorry, I can't come they're not gonna be like oh don't be like that just come they're gonna be like yeah no worries that sound yeah. um which is kind of nice and it, it, if it was the, if it was different i would have probably found it a lot more difficult yeah. yeah have you had have you come across people that like you don't obviously not naming names but like people that you weren't necessarily close with that since you've like got to where you've got they you know want to sort of come out with you and spend a bit more time around you or have you just kept it tight kept no, it close? I kept it pretty tight yeah I didn't um because obviously there's always that that aspect of what's his what's his goal what's the actual end goal of this yeah. person are they are they genuine sort of thing but I've had my my group of mates since sick form or yeah. since before sick form and they've sort of stayed okay so um like going back to, to sort of school and sick form did you, um, when you were coming up through Saints Academy and stuff like that, at like 16, a sort of exam time, and then did you do sick form or college? Sick form, yeah. Onto sick form. Did you still see, like, the real value in your education, or did you? was it all in on rugby? Um, it was. I did really do did see the value of education. Um, so I found out that I had been offered a contract before I took my GCSEs. Right. And... In all honesty, oh, not my GCSEs, my A levels, not my GCSEs. <laughs> um, after I, before I'd done my A levels, and I, I think for me it would have been better if I hadn't known that information. Right, yeah. Because you can tell yourself as much as you want. I'm still trying as hard as I can. Blah blah blah. But I think there's always going to be part of you that doesn't try as hard when you know you've yeah, got something set up. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah. You know you've got something to d- move on to. You, If you haven't got that and you don't know that, it's the fear, yeah. I think. Mm-hmm. You're fearful of what you're going to do, so you will try, push that a little bit harder, try that a little bit harder. And I think, I didn't get bad grades, but um, I think I probably eased off a bit once I found out Right, okay. So that's what I was going to do. That makes sense. Did you have a backup plan, like through through year 12 and 13, before you found out you were getting a contract? 
Yeah, yeah, I, I would have gone to uni and I would have probably gone into strength and conditioning so right. so in some way, probably in a sports science degree and then gone into strength and conditioning through that because I've always wanted, whether it be a player or an S&C or a physio, I've always wanted to be within rugby yeah. as a, or within sport. Yeah, yeah. And like sort of leading on from that, have you... Do you, do you think now you have to sort of pay an interest in what you're going to do after rugby immediately or is that not something you've thought about yet? Um, I think, yeah, immediately because rugby's the sort of sport that your career could finish yeah. with yeah. a click of a fingers. Yeah. You could be training one day, something, touch wood, awful happen and you, um, you're then done and you've yeah. got nothing to fall back on. You've got obviously your your insurance and stuff like that, but that'll only get you so far. You need something to sort of fall into yeah. and something you can go and do after that. Mm. I mean, there's been a few guys at Saints, haven't they? That remember uh, was it Rob Horn? Yeah, like he that was like one tackle career yeah, done, exactly, wasn't it? Yeah, and then there was um, a lad from Worcester. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's been a few recently. It is really scary, and I think it it, it yeah. has over the last few years since these cases have been coming out. It has. Um, sort of given a few people, including myself and most people within rugby, that kick up the band they needed to start to think to life after rugby and what am I going to do? And yeah. I think also it was always there before with uh, the HR and the RPA and stuff like that, but I think that's taken on a new a new step ever since that stuff's come out and that stuff's happened. Yeah. yeah. Do you think much about the um, like the concussion stuff? That's quite a big thing in rugby at the minute. Yeah, I do. Yeah, so I've had quite a few. Right. So it's on, sort of, on my mind yeah. to say, um, yeah, it. It's a would, weird. Would your one. dad have played with Steve Thompson and that lot? That yeah, yeah, yeah. Dad, dad will tell you some stories about his concussions and how it was. It wasn't a thing, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, it wasn't. Brushed on. Yeah, it was a. Are you alright? If you said yeah, they'd be like, "I'll oh, carry on then." Yeah. And. It was almost there was this culture of you'll be fine, I, yeah. even if you're not, you'll be fine, yeah. and if you're not, then you're soft. Yeah, that's like complete opposite to football, isn't it? Like yeah, the moment there's something wrong, like that's straight. just yeah. like old-fashioned rugby yeah. culture, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, which I think obviously has changed completely now, and now they're almost overcautious with everything. If you have yeah. a little knot, you're off. You're getting checked, stuff like that, which I think is the best way to have it, and it's the only way it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna have to be like that. Yeah. But um, it will, I think, in the long term, end up saving a few lads from some some problems. Oh, definitely. definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's very scary. Like, even for guys that I know that play club rugby, like, just yeah. on a Saturday, they have you know, been knocked out, like, four, five times in a season, and they even, like, sit and worry about the sort of long-term effects. So, obviously, professional rugby, that's, like, a whole 100 level. times more physical. Yeah. And, I mean, that, I guess that's why club have protocols in place yeah, and stuff like it's that. It's the weight, I find. So, you've got... Someone that's 120 kilos running at you. Yeah. And that, I'm not, f I can't do physics very well, but 120 that's kilos running. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot. Sort of, <laughs> however fast they run, yeah. hitting you. Yeah. No matter who you are, you're not going to be all right after that. Yeah. No, definitely not. Definitely not. Especially with like union as well. Like they all big boys, yeah, yeah. Especially, you get some big lads on the wing, don't you? Yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, obviously like we're talking about education and all that and like the importance so you get a lot of guys coming out of school and like their one goal is to be a pro rugby player for example they yeah. don't have any sort of backup plan so like what would you say to guys like that that might not make it and you know they might get dropped to 18 rather than getting a contract I think in the same way we just spoke about um, you've, you've got to have something because yeah. you could be the world's best rugby player and you will get a contract and you'll do it for three years, four years. Mm. Then something happens and you've again, you've got nothing to fall back on. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you are the DuPont of the world or some lad that's not quite sure. Mm. Everyone needs something to fall back on because as soon as it sounds like we say a bit cutthroat from from this aspect, but as soon as you're not playing and you're not a superstar anymore, no one cares. Yeah. 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 There's somebody else coming in. Yeah. And that's when you go, Oh no, I'm i I'll be fine. There's there's people, blah, 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 that look after me and you think 
they might look after you for a couple of years. They're not going to look after you for the rest of your life. Yeah. They're not going to support you for the rest of your life and give you money for the rest of your life to live on because because yeah. you've that smash your knees a bit, so you've had too many concussions, been told to retire, or you have just been dropped. They're like you've got to have something. Yeah, I guess you've had like the benefit of your dad around, who's yeah, definitely. Like, your dad's obviously like had a career and then retired and like gone into sort of like normal civilian life. So I guess yeah. that's a, a something that like some lads in your position wouldn't have. Yeah, definitely. And I've, I've got a lot of people around me. So my partner, Lucy, who will helps me with everything, sort of keep, keeps it not grounded, but will be like, oh, you need to make sure you're doing this because like if this happens, then what we're going to do? Yeah. And obviously my mum as well and brother and stuff. And having that sort of, close knit group of people that you really, really trust and value their opinion of around you really helps you sort of and people also that so looking forward into the future, people that are gonna depend on you and people that without well, in your head they probably would be fine, but in your head if you're not helping it's do what you currently yeah. do, yeah. it's gonna stress everything else. And you're not going to be able to. No, I'm not going to be able to pay my mortgage. I'm not going to be able to pay all these sort of bills that are there. So I need something. Yeah. That's there that I can then f- drop for. into. Yeah. And then start to do that's going to going to pay those bills. Yeah. Yeah. So, what what do an ideal next twelve months look like for you in terms of rugby, and life in general? It's hard to say. Um, I've had a this year's been really. Un- I've had a few injuries been quite frustrating so <laughs> an injury for a year would be really nice um but yeah i in all honesty um like i say play rugby and everything else to sort itself out i want to be as long as i'm happy yeah. i'm enjoying playing rugby then that's all that really matters to me yeah definitely and to finish us off could you give us three bits of advice that you'd give a young lad that wants to be a professional rugby player uh work harder than everyone else I know that's a hard, hard one to do because <laughs> you don't know how everyone's working. Um, work harder than everyone else. Um, have a backup plan. Have something to do. And... What's the thing? Think... Think about something that you can do or the skill, a technique, something that you can do or you can start to do or practice that's different or much better than everyone else. Okay. So if you can do something differently that works better, or if you can do something in a much better way and be better at a certain thing mm-hmm. than everyone else, then you're going to get seen and you're yeah. going to get picked up. Okay. I like that. No, that's brilliant. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming in, mate. Awesome. Absolutely no thank worries. You done. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you for watching the latest episode of the Lessons Podcast. Please like, comment, subscribe, and interact in any way you can. Also follow our social media channels at student dot. That's student dot. Thank you.